when Bitcoin took off, it was quite an experience for me to talk to a group of financial people and say something about my place in the history. And somebody would, would bring up the paper on, on the browser and say, oh my God, you're right. That was much easier to do than to, if there were no references in the, um, in the Bitcoin white paper. What I like is the fact that I got to play in the game at all, okay? To feel that I had a role, okay? I'm not saying how large or how small it is, I've made a contribution, and it's the community that we celebrate. It is a community that is flourishing, and I'm glad to have played my part. So I'm Stuart Haber. I am um, working in a, as a one-man consulting company here and there called Stuart Haber Crypto, LLC. That Stuart Haber Crypto, for me, the crypto means cryptography, not, not cryptocurrency, because um, I'm uh, more or less a professional cryptographer. I'm Scott Stornetta, and I'm a partner at a venture capital firm called Yugen Partners. We invest in the blockchain space. I uh, had some doubts about a career in pure mathematics and got interested in various aspects of theoretical computer science and got a degree at Columbia Uptown here in New York in theoretical computer science, specializing in cryptography. I had a very nice job right out of grad school working at Bellcore, Bell Communications Research. So I arrived there winter 87, 88 and was feeling my way around working on some cryptographic problems. In fact, they're cryptographic problems that some part of the blockchain world has heard of. They were working on zero-knowledge proofs when they were brand new, invented by Silvio Macaulay and Shafi Goldwasser and uh, Charlie Rakoff in 85 or thereabouts. I'd been at Belcor for maybe two years when a new young uh, researcher came, came by. Well, we were both pretty young back then. This was uh, 89, named Scott Stornetta, and he was concerned about the problem of ensuring the integrity of digital data. The real concern I had was with the fact that society depends so much on its record keeping, and this is way back 30 years ago, and I could start to see that there would be this transition to entirely digital records, no paper backups, no tape backups, no, no nothing. And I knew how easy it was to alter a digital record without anyone noticing and felt that if we couldn't find a way to ensure the integrity of the records that we kept, then how could we build any sort of trustworthy infrastructure on top of it? And so for me, the quest was how to create an immutable record. In the main conference in, in the field, it was at Crypto 1990 that we delivered the paper. I gave the talk, which was nice, because it was a conference I'd been going to for, for a few years already. And by 91, a year later, with, with, um, with a couple of improvements, we had the algorithm, which was now called the blockchain. That is, we, of course, used one-way hash functions. We took requests for registration of documents, which, of course, meant the hash values of the documents or records in question. We grouped them into units that now, when I talk about this, I call blocks, but we didn't, um, I don't remember what word we, you know, unit, set, bunch, group things into blocks, build a Merkle tree, and had a linked chain of hash values that were essentially, um, as in the Bitcoin blockchain, they were Merkle roots of sets of records with a bit of bookkeeping information in that chain. For me, writing those original papers with Stuart was an important step to get the word out. But I had the sense that it would kind of die on the vine if there wasn't an effort to make it actually practical and available in the world. At the time, we were hoping that the so-called baby bells, the seven owners of Bellcore, the seven uh, regional bell operating companies, would themselves want to offer this as a service. But I guess I was unfamiliar with just how much inertia there can be in large organizations. It seems obvious in hindsight. 
it seemed that the thing would not come into any practical fruition anytime soon if we didn't spin it out and create a freestanding company. It was a little scary, I should just note, to think about doing that. We spun this out of Belcor as a company called Surety, S-U-R-E-T-Y, to commercialize our invention. And we offered this service um, commercially. Already it was, the offering came out winter 94, 95. Using current blockchain world vocabulary, we wanted to be able to achieve, enable worldwide consensus on the um, hash values that were in our blockchain. In 1995, it was, uh, it was still a novelty if I told somebody at a, at a party that I had two or three different email addresses. Uh, there, were, there was not that large a community of people um, interested um, in anything online, let alone integrity of records. Um, so how did we achieve worldwide consensus on our hash values? What we did is every week we would take the sequence of block hash values from the preceding week, build another Merkle tree, and take the root of that tree and publish it in the New York Times, the national edition of the Sunday New York Times. We published the first of those, in fact, in October, it was October 13th, 1991. It was so challenging it did not turn into a thriving business. In fact, our competition was not so much other uh, digital integrity mechanisms. Our challenge was just that the world got along just fine without it. The file save date on the laptop that you're looking at right there is a timestamp for the file containing um, those questions. And in practice, that works fine. If there's a dispute about a particular record, of course, all that can be faked or can be changed but there's a body of circumstantial evidence around it. You're gonna take care of my records and you want me to pay for the service? Um, I, not, we weren't charging very much, but it was still some, something that uh, um, people weren't paying until we, uh, before we tried to sell it to them. It was just a lot harder. Th realize this was a day of dial-up modems and AOL. This is not even internet uh, days and small, small amounts of bandwidth, relatively tiny amounts of storage, and a very siloed view about records, records inside companies, and you don't share anything about those records outside your company. I can remember one of the most intelligent people, most forward-looking people, who was our initial investor. So certainly someone that fully understood the technology and was excited about it. When we told him that in order to seal the records that he had at his own company, he would have to open up his internal computers to internet access, he said, well, that's not going to happen. Why would anyone be so foolish as to do that? So it was, it's hard to grasp what the pre-internet days felt like. And so trying to push a narrative about creating a universal public record in a time where things were even more, much more closed uh, than they are now was a, was a difficult sell. When I put my venture investor hat on, okay, I can't accept a company saying, well, we had a great idea, but it was ahead of its time. Well, the reality is if I had a chance to do it over again, I would have found a way to fashion it for that time and place. The technology could have had many applications. And it's just, it's almost sour grapes, I think, when people say, oh, I had a brilliant idea, but it was just before its time. I'd rather say, well, you had a brilliant technology, but you hadn't found the right product to match the market to start to actually get traction. And so I would put the blame squarely on myself and others for the inexperience of the thing. It's just amazing to watch the flourishing of ideas, not just the Bitcoin white paper from 2008 and the brand new system deployed with the Genesis block in early 2009, but uh, the, uh, all of the things people are doing. Now, now, of course, blockchain has been proposed as the solution for everything for plenty of silly projects. There's lots of interesting work going on and it's great to see the flourishing of it.
to see that someone had come up with something that was good enough to meet a community's long hoped for dreams of, of having this kind of breakout moment. Uh, that was a very happy moment. It's certainly the case, as you mentioned, that when I read it, I thought, okay, that was a good idea. I like that. I like that. Mm, wouldn't have done that. Um, oh, I like that. I like that. With anything, it's, it's mixed. But um, overall, a very positive reaction. People are innovative, and innovations start to speak for themselves, and they catch on. Again, it's, this is not the first time there's been a wave of innovation, right? I, I've lived through a number of, of these waves, obviously computers, the internet, but even before that, I remember working on a slide rule and switching over to a calculator. That was a big, big breakthrough. Seeing people go to the moon, you know, that's part of my piece of history that I can still remember, landing on the moon. And so if you haven't been through multiple waves of that, you may think, wow, this is really different. But that whole landing a person on the moon was such an enormous leap forward and spawned so much follow-on innovation that to me, this is, it's great when it occurs, okay? And it's worth celebrating. But this is maybe the fifth time I've seen this movie. And each one of them is, is terrific. But you do start to see that it's part of an overall pattern.